This is the true story of Ellie Gould, a lover of animals, a driven young woman, someone with a bright future within her grasp. But when young love appeared in her life, things would start to change. An unimaginable chain of events began to unravel. So what would become of Ellie? Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join a quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Remember, choosing to be kind can save a life in many ways. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to those that knew and loved Ellie and all those affected by this case. Ellie Gould was born on the 6th of February 2002. Her family lived in the Wiltshire town of Carn, nestled in the North Wessex Downs, an area of outstanding natural beauty. It's a small community and a very close one. It was the ideal place to bring up children. And the Goulds were, to all intents and purposes, a picture-perfect family. Ellie was known for her bubbly and smiley personality. She had a passion for horse riding and animals, and had ambitions to join the mounted police. When she started sixth form at the Harden School in Chippenham, she quickly made a new set of friends. Ellie was likeable and put a lot into her friendships. The group became close quickly and as the school year progressed, it also got bigger with more boys joining the group. They'd spend every minute that they could together, bonding over teenage things. They were just normal, happy, carefree teenagers living life to the fullest. Ellie and her friends had their whole lives ahead of them. In January 2019, Ellie's mum received the news that every parent dreads. Ellie had a boyfriend. After school one day, Ellie had told her mum that a boy had asked her out. She was giggly and shy, almost embarrassed. What's he called? Her mum questioned. He was Tom Griffiths a boy from Derry Hill. He was in her friend's group at school and was a bright, talented sportsman. Ellie and Tom had had an on-again, off-again thing in lower school, but they made it official when they entered sixth form. This, in Ellie's mum's eyes, was a surprising choice. Ellie was just about to start her exams. She didn't think she was interested in a boyfriend right now. Ellie's dad wasn't overly keen on Tom because he didn't say much, but the parents assumed this aspect of his character was just down to his age. They believed the relationship would just fizzle out, and it seemed they were right. Priorities quickly shifted for Ellie, and boyfriend Tom became a less important part of her life. She decided to focus more on revision, exams, and her girlfriends. By May, she was ready to end the relationship. It was a normal Thursday evening when she ended things. Afterwards, she texted her friends with relief that she finally felt free again. But little did anyone know, her freedom would be short-lived. On the 3rd of May 2019, it was a regular Friday morning in Wiltshire. Carol, Ellie's mum, was at work. She'd left 17-year-old Ellie eating her cereal at home when she left. Ellie would have normally been in school on a Friday morning, but she didn't have any lessons that day, so she was staying at home to revise. Her friend planned to pick her up at around 12 o'clock. She would drive both of them to school for their history class. Carol got a phone call from her husband Matt around lunchtime. This wasn't anything out of the ordinary, he often phoned for a chat. But this call was different. Father Matt was hysterical. He said, Carrie, you need to come home, you need to come home. Ellie's had an accident, she's had an accident. Just drive carefully. Ellie's had an accident. Detective Superintendent Jim Taylor was a senior investigating officer on the case. Father Matt had returned home at around 3 o'clock. 
He had then walked into the kitchen and found Ellie. He thought she had had an accident and immediately sought help from a neighbour. They called the ambulance and the police who were faced with a horrific scene. 17 year old Ellie had passed away. She was found face down in a pool of her own vital fluids. There she lay face down with her right arm across her body, holding onto the handle of a sharp implement. To the naked eye, it looked as though she'd inflicted her wounds on herself. When you consider the nature of her injuries, the amount of blood and Ellie's family circumstances, after all, she was incredibly loved and happy. The police believed there was no way that this injury was self-inflicted. Ellie's distraught parents believed their daughter's tragic death was just a mishap. Had she maybe put the knife in a toaster and electrocuted herself and fallen backwards? Had she fallen off the cabinet whilst holding the sharp implement? While Ellie's parents were struggling to come to terms with her passing, the police were trying to piece together their own version of the story. A neighbour had seen someone call at the address earlier in the day, and whilst they didn't see their face, they did give a description. They were male with a slim build. The search for the mystery visitor was on. It's uncommon for a homicide to occur inside someone's home. This suggests the perpetrator was likely familiar with the victim. The police began to try and connect the dots in Ellie's friend group. Who, if anyone, would want to hurt her? Ellie's friend was questioned about the day that she was supposed to pick her friend up and take her to the history class. And although she was nervous about being questioned by the police, she did her best to answer their questions. She'd received a text from Ellie shortly before she was due to pick her up. She said that she didn't need a lift anymore. The detective's questioning soon turned from Ellie to Tom, the now ex-boyfriend. The friend said, I was screenshotting messages that Tom had sent, and then I looked on Snap Maps to see where he was. Just coincidentally, I thought I'll have a look on Snap Maps, and it so happened to be that he was still in the area. She further explained, I think I thought, oh gosh, Tom's gone over to convince her that they should be together. She thought that Ellie being Ellie will have been blunt with him and said, look Tom, it's not happening. We're not getting back together you need to get over it. The friend also revealed that Tom had messaged everyone on the day of the murder. He sent pictures to a group chat where he shared a photo of himself with scratches on his neck. He said that he had been hurting himself going through a tough time. His friends offered support and urged him to talk to them whenever he felt overwhelmed. For the police, Ellie's ex-boyfriend Tom wasn't just a person of interest, he was the person of interest. When officers caught up with him, he had injuries to his neck which looked fresh. He also wasn't acting normally. But then again, he was a teenager who just found out that his ex-girlfriend, whom he still loved, was dead. It didn't necessarily mean that he was guilty, but he was suspicious. Tom also matched the description that the neighbour had given. He was then deemed as a suspect and arrested. At the police station, Tom continued to deny any involvement in Ellie's death. He explained that on the day of Ellie's death, he'd been dropped off at school by his mum. He wasn't feeling well, so he then returned home. He had spoken to a neighbour about his stress, ill relatives, and about doing harm to himself, and the neighbour then took him back to school. He again became very upset and asked to speak to the school nurse. He once again explained that he was doing physical harm to himself. They then called his mother. She came to pick him up from school and then took him back home. But the evidence the police were gathering was beginning to cast doubt on Tom's version of events. When they analysed his phone, his story just wasn't adding up. At around 10.50am, his phone disconnected from the family router, and it didn't then reconnect until an hour later. His location services were activated on his phone, and they could see that at 10.53am, he arrived at Ellie's house. He didn't leave again until 11.51am. He'd spent almost exactly an hour inside. 
CCTV footage from a bus company also had dashcam footage of his silver Ford Fiesta. This wasn't enough to charge him in connection with Ellie's death, but it was enough to show that he was lying about something. After he returned home, there was an 18 minute gap where he dropped off the router again. This indicated that he'd left his home once again for a short time, a 9 minute walk away from his home address. Search teams were deployed and quickly found what they were looking for. The search teams found a black bin liner. Inside, there were bloodstained tea cloths, napkins and towels. They also searched Tom's home address. Here they found red vital fluid on a pair of his work trainers. When sent to the laboratory, all these items came back as a DNA match for Ellie. Tom had been caught red-handed. Armed with the damning forensic evidence, police charged 17-year-old Thomas Griffiths with Ellie Gould's murder. They had carefully pieced together what had happened that day. On the 3rd of May 2019, Tom was dropped off at school by his mother. After emailing his teachers to tell them he was feeling unwell, he walked to the bus station where he caught a bus back home. His mum had also returned home briefly, forcing Tom to hide in the wardrobe of his bedroom. He didn't want her to know that he was absent from school. When his mother left, he took the keys to the family car and drove to Ellie's house. Following an argument, Tom attempted to throttle Ellie. He then used a sharp implement he had taken from the family kitchen and just jabbed her in the neck 13 times. Tom had spent an hour at the house attempting to clean up the crime scene. He washed his trainers in the kitchen sink and cleaned the knife using an apron, before then placing it in Ellie's hand. He used her finger to unlock her phone, posing as her. He then sent a text message to her friend telling her not to pick her up. He went home to change, put his clothes in the washing machine, and then dumped the bag of evidence in a local woodland. A neighbour saw him returning from the woodlands and drove him back to the school. There, he was collected by his mum after speaking to the nurse. During his hearing in August, Tom pleaded guilty to Ellie's murder. However, in his defence case statement, he gave a new version of events for the day that she passed. Tom said that he drove the car to Ellie's house and they intended to study. After studying for a while, they began to argue about family members. And at that point, Tom claimed to have suffered from amnesia. He said he remembered throttling Ellie, but he then lost his memory. He came to, but Ellie was lying next to him in a pool of her own blood. This story seemed unlikely. Blind rage can lead to forgetting, but in this case, Tom had used Ellie's fingerprint to send a final text message. This wasn't blind rage, and it certainly wasn't amnesia. It was an excuse for a cold and calculated plan. Tom pleaded guilty to Ellie's murder, meaning that the case would not go to trial. On the 8th of November 2019 at the Bristol Crown Court, Ellie's family came face to face with the boy who had gone from boyfriend to killer. He kept his head down and wouldn't look up at anyone. And although he was within weeks of being an adult, he was sentenced as a child because he had no previous convictions. He was sentenced to life but with a tariff of just 12 and a half years a lenient sentence that devastated Ellie's family, friends and the community. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Do let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew. You too can become a channel member for just 99 pence. A huge thank you to my patrons. Your support makes a massive difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. So a big Dark Case thank you too. Rachel Davis. David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, El Palmieri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Krogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Sefiad Variable, Anthony Watson, Jason Coward, Garthian Paler, Jeremy Sebrenek, Joy Burton, Dawn Crock, Michelle Mims, Natalie Lundquist, Anita Ford, Christina Garzon, Annette Perkins, Austin Lounsbury, Joe Ricciardi, Leisha Ball, and Darlene. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.